When Trump speaks in Bitcoin Nashville, he's going to say something extremely bullish. What do you think is going to happen? And that's the United States, the biggest country where the most money is located. When he makes Bitcoin part of some strategic reserve in the US, the Bitcoin price is going to catapult from wherever it is now to God knows what number, past six digits easily, maybe even into, into the millions. He is definitely a changed human being, especially after, you know, someone just attempted an assassination on your life. You cannot remain the same human being. I don't really care who's in power as long as the power of money is stripped from them all. When they go all in with whatever is left on the global supply of Bitcoin, which isn't much, maybe around one and a half million Bitcoin, you're going to wake up one day, the price is going to be some stupid amount and you're going to wonder what the hell happened. I tried to blow it up myself, failed. I tried to do it again, failed again. And then I learned that it's been, you know, 15 years in the making and the governments have tried to do that and they failed. You know, if you add all the taxes plus the debasing, what's left? So if you're making $100, your purchasing power is what at the end of the day? Maybe 10. So 90% of it is being stolen from you. So you're literally working 11 months out of the year like a dummy for free. You have to do the work. The only person that can make Bitcoin 100% solid, secure is yourself. There's like the Bitcoin ETF, there's now Donald Trump supporting Bitcoin, which was not on my my, my radar for, for this year. Uh, we had the halving in between. Uh, what do you make out, uh, out of all these this things? Well, the last 72 hours have been absolutely insane, man. It's like I'm watching a movie and I just can't believe, you know, when it was produced. You know, it's like, it's like, Jesus Christ. Look, there's a lot of attention that's happening all of a sudden around, around Bitcoin. Unfortunately, the attempted assassination of, you know, former President Trump, that, that was, that was absolutely disgusting. And, you know, you can, you can spin as many stories you want that are around this. Um, but at least, you know, to me, from an outsider, I don't think this was a coincidence. I don't think this was, you know, something that was not pre-planned in advance. I think if you were not a believer in God before 72 hours, you definitely might consider being one now because this was, as far as I can tell, divine intervention. I mean, he literally dodged the bullet, you know, on a, on a hairline. Like he had not moved his head at the precisely that exact millisecond. He wouldn't be here. And that, as drastic and dramatic as it is, I think cemented the, you know, the, the future of America. That moment is... You know, that, you know, sign of defiance that he came back with, this is forever. You know, that, uh, that trigger is what went off, you know, at, you know, on that day. And I think a large portion of America, regardless of whether you, you liked Trump before, disliked him, agree with his politics, you don't do this. You know, like if you disagree with someone, you don't kill them. You know, that's a sign, that's a sign of, of weakness. It's a sign of cowardice. It's a sign that you're losing and you're pathetically desperate in your attempts to eliminate the competition, which you failed at, thankfully. A lot of, a lot of eyes are on the space. He is definitely pro Bitcoin. You know, I mean, it's, uh, the more people you want, you know, on your side to accelerate the adoption is definitely a good thing. As far as I'm concerned, you know, by nature, I don't trust politicians. Obviously, you know, they can say whatever they want to gain votes. I mean, maybe, maybe. Maybe this is part of it. Maybe it isn't. Maybe he is a changed man. I think to a large degree, he is definitely a changed human being, especially after, you know, someone just attempted an assassination on your life. You cannot remain the same human being. Okay. So how that ties into Bitcoin is yet to be seen. You know, he's, he's still pushing forward, you know, wanting to talk at Bitcoin Nashville, which is an extremely bullish move on his part, a very brave one. And um, it's a true sign of leadership. Okay, true sign of you know bravado, true sign of a leader, you know, who who shows that he has what it takes to guide the country in the right direction. Again, theoretically, whether he does it, succeeds at it, that's another story. But the energy that he's putting out is definitely you know aligned in uh, in that way. For me, I don't really care who's in power as long as the power of money is stripped from them all, okay? Whether it's Trump or somebody else, regardless of the country, the government, the idea here is to gain Bitcoin's adoption to a point where it will strip the power of money from every single government so that it, they are no longer in a position to abuse, you know, uh, sanction or censor and lead us to the mess, the economic mess that we find ourselves in you know, globally. Oh, really cool. It's, uh, it's, 
it, it's fascinating to see how, how Bitcoin gets more and more into the, to the mainstream. Also now with the, the Bitcoin ETF. And I was wondering what's, what, what's your take on this? Because, um, like it's so important to take responsibility for yourself, to take responsibility in like freedom in your own hands. Um, do you think that the Bitcoin ETF beyond that, if you hold it yourself, like that's a big risk, but if you, if you look at that Bitcoin, could it be a, a dangerous thing that the uh, coins are getting centralized? They're basically all at Coinbase, some at the other places, uh, but they're all like, confiscatable they're all like um there for the governments to take it is, is that a risk that that you see that there are so many coins that they are uh, getting there yeah of course i mean the etf as far as i'm concerned at least the one in the united states is more of a marketing term you know to accelerate the attention to, to bitcoin and perhaps adoption you know amongst those that have never considered it because now it's legitimized by personalities that you know they respect but the etf you know it's uh, the etf itself is not bitcoin ETF, you know, is uh, you, it's, you have exposure to Bitcoin and fiat. So any profits you make are still in the same, you know, debasing currency that, you know, has, that has always existed. So you're, there, there's, is, there's no winning with an ETF. Now, the idea is that hopefully people who get into an ETF, you know, start studying it enough and learning enough about it to understand that this is not where they want to be, that they actually want to be holding the real asset, which leads them to Bitcoin into, in proper self-custody. So whether they start with an ETF simply because, you know, that's just how they start. And the, the, the end game is to getting them into, you know, where they're supposed to be, where they are holding their private keys. They are essentially their own bank. They are the head of security. They're doing everything themselves, which is what they're supposed to. As far as governments are concerned, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the ETF is, is the perfect honeypot for, you know, a government to come and seize. I mean, every, you know, all the money that's in there will automatically disappear. You know, and you have no you have no say in the matter because you know, what are you going to do if it's not in your control it's not yours it's as simple as that i also loved your talk in, in bitcoin prague and you also shared uh before your your story uh why are you so passionate about self-custody maybe um to get the viewers in like why are you so passionate about self-custody and why should they care about self-custody because like for me, it's fascinating how many people still have the Bitcoin just on exchanges. Uh, and when they have self custody, sometimes have very, <laughs> very simple setups where they could easily, um, be attacked or could easily lose them anyway. So, um, why is it important firsthand, like to take the step and do a self custody? And then maybe later on, like, how can we, um, take proper self custody? Well, look, when, when everything is convenient and nothing's really changed for you, you may not understand the urgency and why someone like myself is so adamant and passionate about, you know, Bitcoin in self-custody. For those that are unaware, I'll sum it up really quick. Um, I woke up one day, literally, essentially thinking I was retired and the next day I was homeless. Why? Because the bank had seized my entire life savings, not just mine, but that of the entire country. All right. So when you experience something like this, um, the, the, the shock and the path that it puts you through is something that I don't wish on anyone. It is a movie that you categorically do not want to watch because the after effects of that on a, on a nation is beyond anything you can possibly imagine. So in my case, I had two options. Either I go down the dark path, and in which case I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you, or I find the strength and the courage to rise up and figure out a way to ensure that this never, ever happens to me or ever again. Although, you know, they may have thought they destroyed my life. In, in my case, that's not what happened. In fact, they weaponized me into, you know, a very aggressive tool of education whose, whose number one priority here is to help teach every single individual out there how to make sure this never happens to them or their families ever again. This is what brought me into Bitcoin. It's not for fame. It's not for money. It's not for any of that. It's for a purpose to make sure that the world heads in the right direction and that the corrupt fiat system goes down so that we never have to succumb to its lies, to its, um, to, to its cancerous effects, you know, from now and forever. It's it's fascinating for me. We also had like with you, uh, Rick, on um, with uh, with uh, also amazing story, uh, amazing story, uh, and a story where he lost the twenty five Bitcoin. Uh, we talked about it on the podcast. M maybe let's describe for the viewers when like you you lost on one day everything, 
And then you go ahead and you're like, oh, now I have to work again. Like I have to start from zero. I have to find the courage not to go down that uh, dark path. I have to find the courage to to use that in a good way, not to be uh, a lunatic and not go the, da- uh, the dark path down, but do the right thing in that moment. I feel like that's really, like I, I could not even comprehend. I never went through anything similar to that. Um, how how is that like how did you find uh, in that place in that moment uh, the courage to do that and how long did it took like was it a week was it like a year or how how long was it in in that phase it took a very long time it took me almost a year to come out of whatever mental state i was in to even consider mm. making an effort to to rise again because everything was decimated i literally had nothing like no, no money, no hope. Um, people that, you know, were supposedly friends automatically disappeared. So, you know, I was, I was left with three people that I, w- I could speak to, you know, from the thousands of folks that I was supposedly in touch with, you know, for my entire life, they all vanished. So, you know, compound all of these losses on top of each other. And it really, like, you cannot prepare for something like this. It, uh, the mental toll it takes on you is unfathomable. So it took about a year. And then, you know, it just hit me one day, just, you know, in, the, in my depressive mood watching a video, I think I landed on one of Andreas Antopoulos', uh, Antopoulos videos and something struck, you know, like it hit a chord with me in one of his videos and it took me down the rabbit hole. And this is how I discovered Bitcoin, you know, I, and coming from a cybersecurity background, obviously, I have to question everything as well. You know, I'm like, okay, yeah, sure. Okay, this is like the golden ticket to, to paradise. You know, what's wrong with it? And so I tried to blow it up myself, failed, tried to do it again, failed again. Like, all right, let's try to, you know, do some more research, ask some more intelligent people, see what, you know, what they, how far they've gotten, failed. Um, and then I learned that it's been, you know, 15 years in the making and the governments have tried to do that and they failed. So I'm like, all right, hold on. So maybe there's some substance to this. And this is, you know, where I started researching more and, you know, reading more, spent like over 20, 30, 40,000 hours, you know, diving deep into this, trying to you know, debunk everything good about it, failed again. And so after a certain point, you realize that this is not a joke. Okay. This is Bitcoin was not something that was created overnight. This must have been something that was in the works for an extremely long time. And the version we have now is actually the first time we have a working product, you know, a, wor- a working money that's finite in supply that nobody can control, manipulate, or screw around with. The only thing you can do with it is hold and use it. That's it. And you don't need anybody's permission you know, to, 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 to transact with it. That was the clincher for me. You know, for me, I need I needed to find a way to ensure that no one can rip me off again. All right. So where, where's that option? Thankfully, we have it. If we didn't have Bitcoin, we'd be in a very dire situation. So, but very quickly, I learned that in order to take advantage of everything that Bitcoin offers, you cannot be entrusting it to third parties. It's as simple as that. The illusion of convenience that we've been brainwashed to think, you know, that you know, companies will take care of you. Yeah, you can trust them. Yeah, they're okay. They're good people. Forget it. When things go bad, you're not the priority. You're the casualty. And so in order not to put yourself in that predicament, unfortunately, you're going to have to do the work. And by work, I mean learning something new. It's not nuclear science. Bitcoin in self-custody is not, you're not putting a man on the moon. You're learning a few extra steps. That's it. So the fear and anxiety that people have with this is because it's technology and most people are not very comfortable on a computer. So they automatically think that they're going to mess it up somehow. And I don't believe that's true. Because I've worked with hundreds of folks from all walks of life. Most of them have zero computer backgrounds, zero technical skills. But yet, when you have a good teacher that's able to translate this complexity into a language that a 10-year-old can understand, then everything is easy. And every single one of them, to this day, is the captain of their own ship with full self-confidence. They send, they receive, they sleep well at night. They have absolutely zero concerns about anything. In fact, a lot of them move up into some of the more advanced techniques on their own later on as, you know, as all this knowledge cements in their head and they become really comfortable with it. 
then you know they have the courage that's okay can we improve it a little bit more of course you know but you have to start somewhere and this is you know this is the process that we guide everyone through from beginning to infinity it's technology it's progressing it's not a set it and forget it thing again you are the head of security you're the bank so you always have to stay on top of this because this is your generational wealth if you lose it you're not getting it back unless you earn it or if it's still somewhat affordable to you buy it but the days of buying bitcoin those are going to disappear very very quickly in fact i think 2024 will be the year where i'd say 95 percent of the world cannot buy bitcoin anymore because of all the big institutional and big player interests now that all of a sudden they're fomoing in because they've studied bitcoin they understand what it is and they are and they and they fully are fully cognizant that if they don't hedge against a collapsing fiat currency, all their high net worth value is going to come down to one big fat zero. So, you know, you have these big players with unlimited budgets, so to speak, against regular folks like you and me. So when they go all in with whatever's left, you know, on the global supply of Bitcoin, which isn't much, maybe around one and a half million Bitcoin, you're going to wake up one day, the price is going to be some stupid amount, and you're going to wonder what the hell happened. You, you said 2044? No, 2024. This oh, year. Th this year? Yes. So, so yeah. you think that b beyond that year, uh, normal folks cannot then buy Bitcoin? Or Look what's happening. Look what's going to happen on the way to just the US elections. When Trump speaks in Bitcoin Nashville, I don't know what he's going to say, but I'm assuming he's going to say something extremely bullish. What do you think is going to happen, right? And that's the United States, the biggest country where the most money is located. If they FOMO in, actually, it's not if, it's when they FOMO in, because now it's legitimized. Again, you know, Bitcoin doesn't need to be legitimized, but in the brains of the masses, that works. So whatever it is that gets them into Bitcoin doesn't really matter as long as they get into it. So when it's legitimized, of course, they're going to FOMO in. When, if he makes um, Bitcoin part of some strategic reserve in the U.S., what do you think is going to happen? The, it, Bitcoin, it's, it's, the Bitcoin price is going to catapult from wherever it is now to God knows what number, past six digits easily, maybe even into, into the millions. Because now you've got, you know, the high net worth institutions with the billion dollar budgets. They're like, we need to get this and quickly. So that type of FOMO will take Bitcoin to astronomical um, fiat values. And yeah, of course, that means that the normal folk is not going to afford anything. So how do they take advantage of it? Well, it's very simple. They're going to have to earn it. That means, you know, folks going, uh, going to work will no longer want to be paid in this toilet paper, local currency. They're going to say, pay me in sats. I don't want the dollar. I don't want the euro. It's worth nothing, that fucking garbage. I can't buy anything with it. Pay me in sats. That's what I think is going to happen. That's how the masses are going to benefit from Bitcoin. Because if you can't buy it anymore, like you know most people have been doing for the last 15 years, that there's no other way to get it. That's, uh, that's a major concept there. Yeah. It's, it's really interesting for me because we're like we we built out all the buckets. Like we have nation states with El Salvador and others uh, in the game. We have not the ETFs, the institutional. We have publicly traded company. We've like we've like built in the last few years all the buckets, and now they just wait to get filled and get get up. It, it's like uh, fascinating if, if it actually goes that quick with the United States and and Trump. And, and I, I also guess that there's something big coming. He's not coming to a Bitcoin conference just to say hello. Like he's. He, he has some agenda. He has some, some, some things that he wants to announce there. He's not just coming there to like, Hey, I'm in Bitcoin now. Like he has to say something. Huh? Absolutely. I don't know what his motives are, but I'm fairly confident that whoever has been speaking to him in the background has been educating him enough about Bitcoin that it's changed his position. Now, again, it could be for votes. It could be some ulterior motive, but I think in a big enough part, he actually believes it. You know, I mean, you, you, you can almost tell from the way he talks about it now more every time he says something about it, that he's been learning more and he's like just fascinated with what, what he's seeing. So how that 
what that translates into at the end of the day, if he becomes president, which I really hope he does, um, is to be seen. But ultimately, ultimately, even he has to accept that for this to really flourish and to take the nation into that utopian future that he's talking about, he has to let go of the power of money from the state. That's a big one. So whether that happens or not, I have no idea. Ultimately, I think it happens over time. Okay. But whether it happens quickly now, this year, next year, that's anybody's guess. I'm hopeful that it does, but TikTok, let's wait. Absolutely. And it's like time is on our side. Like we, we are in here, like, uh, we're doing our work and we're doing the, the things. And if anyone here listening is not in Bitcoin or is not, uh, doing self custody, like it's now time to actually take it seriously. And it, there's also something that came up when we talked with Rick. And I think that's an, an amazingly important, um, thing to do. Get your Bitcoin and your self custody properly right before you get I think he meant it like hilariously rich. Like before you get that uh, God candle to like 1 million US dollar uh, in, 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 in Bitcoin, before that you, you have to take the steps and not like, oh, oh wow, uh, all of a sudden I have like uh, 3 million in, in my Bitcoin wallet. <laughs> now uh, let, let's call Tony now <laughs> what to do. <laughs> the, the problem is why, why so many people are still hesitant about this. First of all, it's because it's new. And second of all, it's because, no, we're not living in the future yet. You know, if there was a way to sort of like kick you 30 years, you know, ahead so you can see what uh, what the future uh, built on something like Bitcoin looks like and then, you know, bring you back into here, you'd be accumulating it like your life depended on it. But in order to have that vision, to have that conviction, this is where, you know, you have to do the work. You have to do the reading. You have to ask the questions. You've got you've got to study it because, you know, you've never seen it before. It sounds like it's too good to be true. You know, a lot of, a lot of skeptics have you know, tried to debunk it, have to try to blow it up, have to make it fail. They all failed. Okay. So Bitcoin's not going anywhere. And now that the, the big players are paying serious attention to it, I suspect in the near future, especially like if, uh, if someone like Trump becomes president, I suspect, I strongly suspect that at some point anyone attempting to mess around with the Bitcoin network on any level will be committing a crime. You know, that's, that's how big I think it's going to become because now, you know, if countries are using it as its base reserve, well, they're not going to tolerate any funny business to, towards it, right? Whether it's successful or not, that's besides the point. If you screw around and caught trying to mess around with the Bitcoin network, you'll be thrown in jail or something, something along those lines. I genuinely strongly believe that this is going to happen as soon as there's like a, um, um, a legal le legitimization of Bitcoin in any one of these big countries. And then the rest will follow. The, the copycats will just, you know, apply it across the board. That, that, that's fascinating. So you think that the law actually right now that sometimes goes a little bit against Bitcoin and especially with KYC and all, all that things um, that will in the future actually protect the network, protect the monetary policy of Bitcoin. So like if you mess with Bitcoin... You, you cannot do that. Like that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because now it's the foundation powering your country. It's the foundation fueling your economy. Everything is, is based on it. So the technology is, is rock solid and it's going to continue to be improved and all that stuff. But I'm 100% sure that there are going to be rules to protect it furthermore, just to avoid any potential risk to it that you may or may not see, you know, immediately so if you had if someone had any like like stupid ideas to try to mess with it having a law like this in place should de-incentivize most crazy people you know that's fascinating yeah okay let's let's go in there like uh when okay let's say trump announces something in in end of july on uh starting in august uh then like we wake up to a hundred thousand dollar price maybe we wake up a few weeks later like to two hundred fifty thousand dollar price maybe at end of the year maybe some somewhere next year like a millions or something like that 
what what do you think happens that like the the major players are in um what are the like the immediate steps of like governments of banks of central banks does central banks announce that they are buying bitcoin and ba trying to back the us dollar with with bitcoin or something like that they probably will have to you know i mean if they want to remain relevant i don't think they have an option if bitcoin reaches let's say a million dollars or more in fiat value that means that the dollar is literally worth nothing Okay, I mean, you don't get the million dollar Bitcoin and maintain you know, the purchasing power of the dollar's value today. That's not that that's like somebody's wet dream. That's not the way it works. So this is where the panic there. I think there will be a lot of panic, you know, like, you know, pe most people are going to be saying like, why didn't anybody tell me where did this come from? I've never heard of it before, you know, and blah, blah, all that stuff. And, you know, the world will change very, very quickly, maybe in a little bit of a panic mode, because I don't think this is going to be anything you can um quietly controlled right that's when something breaks it, it 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 breaks so this is what i think is going to happen and you know like i said earlier people will are going to start demanding to be paid in it they're no longer want they, they'll no longer accept working for uh, you know a worthless piece of paper because they're essentially working for free you're essentially already working almost for free depending where you are now if your job your your income is still in fiat dollars in fiat currency, because one, you're earning in a, in a piece of paper that's losing value at an accelerating rate, I'd say around maybe 15% or more, depending where you are. That's one. Two, you're being taxed on it, depending where you are, that can be up to 50%. So what's left? You know, if you add all the taxes plus the debasing, what's left? So if you're making $100, your purchasing power is what at the end of the day? Maybe 10. So 90% of it, is being stolen from you. So you're literally working 11 months out of the year like a dummy for free when you're, when you were, when you were in, in a fiat standard, right? Depending again where you live. I mean, there's a range, but for sure, most of your year, you are working for free. If you actually take the time to do the math and realize, Hey, wait a minute. I'm not just being ripped off because I can't afford anything at the supermarket. I'm being ripped off from all parts. And you know, once that sinks in, You know, someone with a bit of common sense will be like, shit, how do I stop this? That's when you start hopefully asking the intelligent questions. And no matter where you look, okay, there's no company that can make it safer. That's a myth. That's, that's bullshit. Okay. You have to do the work. The only person that can make Bitcoin 100% solid, secure is yourself. There's no such thing. I can't do it. I'm too stupid. Nobody's too stupid. You may be too lazy. Or you maybe come up with some sort of excuse to justify why you don't want to do it. But intellectually, I've yet to meet anyone that, you know, cannot follow clear and concise ins uh, instructions, you know. So in the fiat world, nothing about your money or your information is private. The KYC that you're doing is not for your protection. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a surveillance tool. Okay, so when people are using Bitcoin in a KYC environment, they're essentially indirectly painting a target on themselves because now, wherever that KYC information is, you have no control over how it's being stored. So when you think you're doing, you know, uh, you're using a company to protect your Bitcoin, but you have to KYC with them, well, do you know how they're saving your information? You have no idea. You're assuming. They're doing a good job because they're reputable, right? But many big companies have been hacked. And what happens when they're hacked? Well, you're a casualty of that problem. Now you have to deal with it. But the difference is now, this is Bitcoin, the world's most valuable, never seen before asset. So if someone who's holding your information that you own X amount of Bitcoin gets hacked, the person who hacked him, this is not an idiot. This is someone who knows exactly what they're going after and why. So now you've got a potentially a big problem that you have to deal with your own protection. Okay. So don't trust verify when you're not doing the work yourself, 100%, you, you, the individual are introducing probably a lot of times unknowingly, but you are introducing unnecessary risk to yourself, right? So at the Bitcoin way, we are trying to push this education 
as much as possible to hopefully let it sink in deep enough that people understand that the old habits of relying on somebody else, they don't work. In fact, in this case, they can potentially be dangerous. So there's a lot of information, you know, that we have to unlearn and relearn in order to move properly into the future that we want. If you watch or listen to my podcast on a regular basis, I guess you already bought some Bitcoin. And now the most important step is to keep the Bitcoin, keep them secure in a hardware wallet. My personal recommendation for hardware wallet is the Bitbox. It's super secure. It's simple to set up. It's also a perfect gift for a friend who has still the Bitcoin on an exchange. And you can get a 5% discount with the code Robin at the checkout. Visit bitbox.swiss slash robin to get your bitbox and if you really want to bulletproof your self-custody setup your security setup and maybe even your citizenship set up you have to talk to the bitcoin way if you go to the bitcoinway.com slash partners slash robin you get a 30 minute free call where you can dive deep with them if your self-custody setup is secure, if your citizenship is secure or maybe might be improvable, or your digital footprint in general is secure. They are the experts in cybersecurity, in Bitcoin self-custody, and how to be a secure, sovereign individual in general. And for those of you who are in search of a new Bitcoin exchange where they can buy their Bitcoin from, I recommend my personal Bitcoin exchange 21 Bitcoin. With code Robin, you get a hefty discount for all your purchases in the future. It's it's fascinating for me. Like when we go uh, in self custody, I feel like there's like a lot of mistakes that happen. Like the first and number one mistake is like they don't do it. <laughs> I think that's the, that's, the, that's yeah, the, that's number the, one. That's number one. Um, but for those who want to do it or who already have a setup, what should they first look at? Like what's the the major things they're like? Okay, let's. Let's fix that first. Let's do that first uh, and see if there's like, what are like your first like three, four questions that you usually ask someone who already has a self-custody? That's an excellent question. Again, you know, Bitcoin is technology. So you can't be, you know, nonchalant about the components that you use to do self-custody. We're very strict on the recommendations we do for hardware and software because, you know, you want to minimize the risks as much as possible. So... We only work with open source and or verifiable source Bitcoin only products. Okay. Anything or anyone that, you know, engages in censorship that does, you know, chain analysis, all of that stuff, we automatically boycott them. We don't recommend them. We don't sell anything ourselves. We are like, like, you know, like a Switzerland of knowledge here. We're neutral ground where we're always on the lookout for what's new, what's good, what's bad in order to push out these recommendations to folks. Um, we're big fans of air-gapped hardware wallets. If your hardware wallet connects to a computer, for us, it doesn't work. Now, it could be safe today, right? But I come from cybersecurity. I know that bugs, whether intentional or not, can happen at any point in time, right? So if it happens, God knows when, and you become a, a, a victim of that, of that bug, and it's too late. So why take the risk when you know you don't have to take the risk? Okay. So you have to be very strict about these things. Even if there's a 0.01% that something can go wrong, we won't take it. And we will not recommend that you, the individual, take it because we have an option where your risk is zero or at least closer to zero than that. And so this is the mindset that we deploy when you know we guide people through that process. We're not looking at the Bitcoin price today. We're looking at the value of this asset 50, 100 years into the future and guarding it with dear life starting today, okay? And this is, again, it's not a set it and forget it procedure. You know, as the technology progresses, you need to keep up with your own setup. So I'm the type of person, if there's like a half an inch improvement that can be done to my already bulletproof configuration, I will do it. And I will tell you about it so that you can consider doing it yourself. That's like the moral high ground that we, that we use, you know, when we approach these things. Everybody here is becoming, you know, their own head of security. And so 
you need to take this stuff seriously because when you wake up one day and you see the Bitcoin price at like a billion dollars, you're going to thank God that you've done the work and that you're for the most part um, sleeping well at night. And even then, as soon as you see these crazy numbers, even though your setup is flawless, you're going to still think there are ways to improve it. That's just human instinct, you know, like, oh my gosh, now it's worth that much. Am I okay? Right? So it's important to stay, you know, calm and collected and not, you know, go crazy in a situation like this because that's when, you know, um, silly mistakes happen. So this is what we're here for. We're on top of this um, 24-7, you know, no, no one at the Bitcoin way um, sleeps. You know, we've been professional nappers you know, for a very long time now. So, uh, and, and that's why, you know, like, again, like my mission here really is to empower folks to genuinely understand this, you know, because when you come from where I came from, you don't want to see anybody go through that. Like, it's very hard for you to comprehend what I'm trying to relay to you, because unless you've been in my shoes, you know, it's, it's never a hundred percent, you know, you can imagine how crazy it is, but unless you're in the, in that position, in, in my shoes, you will never be really, you know, you can't really feel what, what fuels someone who has been there before. And I pray to God, you never have to be. It's interesting. I think um, when we uh, look at Bitcoin on Bitcoiners, why they don't do self custody, why don't they don't care about self custody that much is like they hold a sick uh, um, amount of Bitcoin and it's maybe like 10% of the net worth is maybe 15% of the net worth. And they don't take this amount too serious. And when we look in the past of like 10 years back in Bitcoin, that's why all those early Bitcoiners lost their Bitcoin because they left it on some, uh, some USB stick or some, somewhere and they throw it out or like the, the computer that it was on, they, they threw the computer out because they did, did not took that 10,000 Bitcoin that was on the laptop serious. But if you look at now, it makes like, oh, why did they throw out that PC? Um, so I think it helps a lot when, when we think about self custody. What's the future value? As you also said, like in 50 years, in 100 years. Um, and that's leading up to my question. Like, what do you think is a significant amount in Bitcoin when we talk about Satoshis? Is like a million Satoshis, uh, for people to, to know, like, what, wh what will that buy? What, what, what will be the significance of owning like a million Satoshis, 10 million Satoshis, 100,000 Satoshis in like 50, 100 years? That's a very good question and nobody really knows, but what I can tell you, it's going to be worth a lot more than people think. I mean, again, this is, this is such a scarce asset that you don't need much of it to, for it to make a, like an impactful change on your life. The key to this is not how much of it you own because past a certain amount, whether, you know, you own a billion or a trillion, like, what are you going to do? You're going to eat more. You're going to fly more. You're going to do more. You're not, you're not, nothing is really going to change past a certain point. It's just sitting there, just a, like a, a flex symbol, right? But practically nothing's going to really change. Um, so you don't need much of it. You know, a lot of people think, oh, I can't afford an entire Bitcoin, but you don't have to own an entire Bitcoin. Own whatever you can now. Just get out or at least start coming out of that failing money that you think is good for you into something that will actually appreciate in value. Ignore the volatility, because it's only temporary, you know, we're transitioning from an old system into a new one. So of course, there's going to be this, but this is temporary. But for you not to panic when you see this, you need to understand what the uh, what the asset is about. The problem is in like in in those in privileged countries is that people are adopting Bitcoin from a from a safe perspective. Oh, we're buying it, you know, like it's because um, I'm going to become even more rich, you know, like they're buying it, but you know, they have one foot here and one foot there, like one foot is in Bitcoin as an investment, but they continue to live in, in the fiat world because they're only calculating their value of Bitcoin in fiat numbers, which is the complete ridiculous mindset. If you're going to live on a Bitcoin standard and you genuinely believe in Bitcoin, then live on a Bitcoin standard and adopt the Bitcoin ethos. Don't sit on the sidelines telling the world, yeah, I'm in Bitcoin, but then everything about you is fiat because one you're, one, you're a hypocrite and two, you're not doing it properly. And three, you're likely to, make, to, 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 to probably sell if something extreme 
happens enough to you, you will screw it up somehow, right? So, and there's a lot of people in this space that I noticed are doing this, you know, Bitcoin influencers. But, you know, when you, when you scratch beyond the influence, they're fiat people at the core. So how do you know this? Well, do you accept Bitcoin payments? No. Why? You talk about Bitcoin all day. It's the greatest thing since humanity, right? But do you accept Bitcoin payments? No. So what are you doing? Why, why don't you accept? I have to ask my accountant. Why? Does he know about Bitcoin? Your accountant, all he is is a government prostitute, you know, put into place to make sure that they get paid. Why are you asking your accountant? He knows nothing about Bitcoin. Why do you need his permission? Bitcoin was created to empower you, the individual. It means you don't need anybody's permission. You don't need the government's permission. You don't need your accountant's permission. You don't need your wife's permission. You don't need your partner's permission. You don't need anybody's permission. All you need to do is understand what it is, have enough conviction, and then you are your own boss, right? Bitcoin in self-custody is king. Your freedom is attached to that because without your money, you're nothing. You're somebody else's donkey because if they can control your money, you can't do anything. And we saw this happen three, four years ago, right? What do you think central bank digital currencies are, are for? It's to tighten the grip on the surveillance state. What are your options if you get stuck in this system? You are finished, my friend. You are categorically finished because nothing about your decisions are yours anymore. So if you don't want to find yourself in this predicament, you cannot trust anything outside of yourself. If you do, you're an idiot because you, again, you are bringing in this unnecessary risk to your life, to your freedom, if you have kids, to their lives and their futures. So there's a lot to absorb with something like Bitcoin because, again, we've never had this option before, right? So people need to take the time to study it properly, to understand it, that it's not just some lunatic on the internet just pushing it because whatever. There's a reason. But you need to do it right. You need to stop listening you know, to the, to the bells and whistles and understand at the core what your responsibilities are. Because if it's not done right, you are taking a chance of losing it all. Uh, short story time, um, because Tony, uh, you also pushed me that finally I also accept uh, Bitcoin for, for my sponsorships and, and for partnerships, <laughs> uh, because, uh, I, I procrastinated, like, as you said, like, I was like, I know how to do all the things because I come from sales. I come from the field world. I, I know how to do all the bookkeeping. I know how to do everything in the field world. And I always procrastinated with accepting Bitcoin payments uh, uh, because it's like, ah, I have to think about how to do it. But then I was like, I'm a hypocrite. <laughs> like, well, I, I talk about Bitcoin all day long and then I don't accept it. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really glad that uh, that you were like the, the, the last final push that I needed to like, oh, let, let's actually work on a Bitcoin standard. Like, what, like if, if I really want to be 100% in Bitcoin, it does not, like I have everything in Bitcoin. I have such a, such a small uh, bank account that I use for my everyday payments where I cannot pay with, with Bitcoin. But it, uh, beyond that, I also have to accept it. And I also have to try to live as close to Bitcoin standard as, as humanly possible, uh, uh, right now because I'm in Austria. Um, so yeah, I, I also accept that because of you are like, you were the final, <laughs> final straw that I needed, uh, to accept the Bitcoin standard also in, in for, for, for my podcast. So yeah, thank you for, for doing that, by the way. Well, you're very welcome. And I'm glad, I'm glad it was helpful because, you know, there's, there's a lot of fear involved in doing something like this because, you know, you've been brainwashed since the day you were born to think that, you know, you have to do, you have to obey the government. You have to use their money. You have to pay their taxes. You have to, you have to, essentially you have to be, remain, you know, a government stooge, you know, that, that, that's essentially what you're brainwashed since day one. And now you don't have to, but because your brain is still wired that way, it's, it's very hard for people to, break that that mindset it's almost like a, a drug addiction you know it's bad for you 
but it's like it's almost impossible for you to let go unless somebody rips you out of it and then you're clean and then you can move forward in uh, in the right direction accepting bitcoin encouraging others to accept bitcoin so that you know circular economies grow at a much faster rate it's a, it's important everybody's life improves dramatically on a bitcoin standard you just have to make the first step to first of all understand it but then do it just just try it and it's it's almost like magical when you see how well life changes for you I've never met a Bitcoiner that complains about money. And I'm not, I'm not talking about high net worth individuals. I'm talking about extremely regular folks like myself that have nothing, that have lost everything and are just now starting to rebuild their lives. So their economic financial status is almost flatlined. But why aren't they complaining? It's because with whatever little crumbs that they have, somehow they can pay for everything without having to stress. I'm not talking about going out and buying Lamborghinis and private jets and all that stupidities. I'm talking about having a nice, modest, happy life with people that align with your values, which is again something that you, uh, you gain on a Bitcoin standard because you start um, being attracted to folks that are also Bitcoiners. And it's almost like a magical connection when you meet someone for the first time if they're a Bitcoiner, somehow there's always conversations that flow smoothly between you, right? Like there's always things in common, even though you've never seen this person for, you know, except for the last five minutes. So there's a lot to gain that are unspoken of, you know, and I think those that are not making the effort to, to understand this properly are missing out on, on such a beautiful future. I mean, if you're on a Bitcoin standard, you're already, for the most part, living in the future. Um, and for those that are still hesitating, I strongly urge you to change that mindset or at least consider changing it for your own benefit. Now I just have to go to the Google uh, because they, they pay me with AdSense. They, I have to ask them also if they pay me in Bitcoin. That, that, <laughs> yeah, good luck with that. that, <laughs> that, that <laughs> yeah. the, 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 the other sponsors are probably easy. They, they will pay me in Bitcoin, but uh, the Google will be a hard one. <laughs> yeah, I know Google is still a matrix uh, matrix player, unfortunately. But but they also pay Bitcoin, so it's okay. <laughs> I'm right, well. Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> but but yeah um do, but by the way uh, do, do you have uh, a fiat bank account do, do you need some like uh, do you have your setup so far that you don't even need the, the fiat bank account i have a fiat bank account but i haven't seen it in like uh, god knows when like i don't i don't touch it anymore you know like i mean it's there but you know if i i need it for something really ex like really specific other than that i have no use for it just uh -huh. dealing just just the thought i have to deal with these dimwits at the bank is enough for me not to want to go to that bank, you know? So, um, you know, just from a stress level, you know, like if you want to live a nice peaceful life, a nice Zen life, you avoid <laughs> the fiat system because it'll just, you know, make your blood boil. You know, when I see stories online about people want to withdraw cash and then this 50 cent, nobody tells them not today, you know, like what, how are you supposed to react? Uh, I totally agree. Um, one big, one question that I ask myself a lot, and I also ask it a lot in, in the um, in the podcast. Um, when we talk about self custody, uh, it seems that right now not a lot of people actually adopted a proper self custody standard. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that proper self custody will ever be mainstream, or will it always be for a small woken up group that actually understand what's going on? No, I think the adoption will grow for sure, but it'll grow uh, much faster once people experience some sort of extreme pain. That's what I think is going to happen. I mean, it's, uh, you can talk, you know, all day long, but most people will not act on it until they start to feel the fire. And either they go through like some crazy pain where they lose access to everything like I did, you know, that, that's, that for sure will catapult you into into proper self-custody because you now you know what it feels like to have nothing and you know debate whether your life is still worth living so uh, it's going to it's going to happen 
how soon it happens, I have no idea. Fortunately, we're seeing a lot more people, you know, come to their senses when it comes to this. Maybe not a hundred percent living on a Bitcoin standard, but they are doing the full self custody. And one thing to keep in mind: this whole, uh, the whole concept of self custody is not isolated or limited to young tech folks. In fact, most of the people that we consult with at the Bitcoin way, I'd say mid to late fifties, well into their eighties. All right. Again, these are not people that come from tech backgrounds. In fact, less than one percent come from tech backgrounds. Yes, they're maybe comfortable on a computer, like they understand how to copy paste, you know, move things into folders and things like this. So they're able to follow, you know, clear and concise instructions, but they don't come from a world of tech. They come from wherever they come from. But now they are, so to speak, cybersecurity experts because, you know, they've opened their minds to learning this information. And once they have they are absolutely happy that they did. It was, in fact, one of their best decisions. This is, I'm quoting many people that we've worked with. Like, this was the best decision I've ever made. Thank you so much. For me, that's enough. Yeah, it's it's also fascinating for me uh, in general, Bitcoin and Bitcoin, the the age groups, because like I'm 25, but when I look at my statistics and I just pulled it up now, um, it's like, under 25 is only 6% of my audience. <laughs> uh, and the average uh, and the biggest group is like around 45 years old. So like, uh, um, it, it's not that Bitcoin is just for like the young crowd or like under 30 years old. Actually, the, the biggest crowd that get Bitcoin or like have Bitcoin, at least like what I see in, in my viewership with like, I think 10 to 20,000 per week that, that look at the podcast, um, they are actually 40, 45, 50. And I even have, um, above 55, uh, 20% of my viewerships, like above 55. That's, that's really cool. It's interesting for me to, to see that because like when I first thought about Bitcoin, I immediately thought, yeah, they, they will be like in my age group. Then I went to the Bitcoin meetups and I'm like, uh, 10 years younger than <laughs> most there. Like I feel really young in the Bitcoin community these days. Well, when you reach you know, like your mid forties and up, you've accumulated a certain amount of wealth, right? And your amount of savings. So for you to lose it, you know, at 50 and up, is very different from you to lose it when you're 25. I mean, at 25, you're still young, you know, you, there's a lot more opportunity for you to rebuild yourself versus someone who's, a, who's you know, considerably older. I think this is where the, the, the distinction comes in. You know, and somebody who's, you know, in well in the 60s, 70s, well, obviously, you know, they've accumulated... Um, you know, whatever amount that they've accumulated, but now they need that amount. You know, they cannot risk losing it because if it's gone, where are they going to get it from? Unless, you know, like, unless somehow they manage to find a job or get back up on their feet, which is very unlikely. This was, again, you know, it's one of the very painful realities that I had to witness um, back in Lebanon when things blew up is that, you know, I lost a lot of folks that I knew because they just couldn't deal with the pain, which is, you know, again, part of that horror movie that I was mentioning. This is, this is, not, a, this is not a joke. You know, this is extremely serious stuff. And you also mentioned uh, when you talked about that, that you found Andreas Natanopoulos, you found Bitcoin, and it's like a little bit of hope uh, that you got from there. Um, what would you say you would right now do without Bitcoin? Like what, what would uh, be probably the, the best steps right now if there like would not be any Bitcoin? That's a very dangerous question, man. You know, when, when you're in a very dark mindset, I don't know. I don't even want to contemplate answering that question, honestly, because it, uh, the, the, the mere thought of it, you know, frightens me. Um, if there wasn't Bitcoin, you know, we'd, at some point, I think we'd, and at least a big part of the population would be in revolt. I don't think um, the human race, at least not all of it, was was born to be enslaved. You know, not everybody's good with, you know, taking directions from criminals and bullies and thieves, right? I, for one, am not. I would rather die than live, you know, in a world like this under this type of uh, scenario. And I'm sure I'm not alone in this. So if there wasn't Bitcoin, a sort of like a peaceful way, you know, to arm the people, to retake power back 
from the corruption, it would have to result in uh, war and violence and rebellion at some stage. Yeah, I also think like that. It's it's like I'm just really glad that it's there. And probably if, if we would not have Bitcoin at some point, hopefully someone else would have created something similar than than Bitcoin. Um, it's like I think it's just a matter of time till there's something like that got discovered. And I'm glad that it got discovered because yeah, maybe maybe. If it did not was for Satoshi Nakamoto, maybe we would not have it for another hundred years, something like that. I don't know. It's, a, it's a, not a good place to look at, but it's interesting to think about it. Of course. And it's that immaculate conception of Bitcoin that's such a blessing that made this work. I mean, whoever Satoshi Nakamoto was, you know, honestly, that's why a lot of people um, consider Bitcoin almost like a religion, because it was almost like a gift from some divine intervention to the world. For someone to create something like this and want nothing to do with it because they know that's how it wins, man, that's that's like that's not I don't like how is that even a human characteristic? Like you have to be really strong as a and a selfless as a person to do this because you know he has or they have a million Bitcoin. Like if this person was after money and fame. He'd be like the richest person in the world today, right? With a million Bitcoin. But they're gone. And they knew this was going to happen. And they did it anyhow for the greater good. So this detail cannot be forgotten. You know, like every day, I thank God, wherever the Satoshi Nakamoto is, you know, I pray that they are good. If they're still on earth, that they are They're good and healthy. And if they're gone, well, God bless them. And thank you, infinity, for that gift to restore hope to all of us that had completely lost it at some point in time. I, I truly really think so. Like, I think also like the, this one million Bitcoin of, of his, like the first, like they, they will never move. Like if, if he actually is alive, uh, the most likely scenario, as I think it is like he lost the key on purpose for, yeah, for the first 1 million and uh, like mine it a little bit and has some like extra stack of like a few 50,000 or something like that, um, a Bitcoin. So yeah, but, uh, it's fun to speculate about that. Um, last question before we get to our end routine, what can we learn from you besides Bitcoin, besides cybersecurity, besides self custody? Um, uh, what, what else could we learn from you? Life is precious, man. And, uh, you can't live it very nonchalantly and casually thinking everything's going to be okay simply because it's okay in the moment. You know, you always have to prepare for, for the worst and hope it never happens. Um, the lesson I learned, the painful lesson I learned is that without ownership of your money, you have no freedom in this, in this lifetime. You cannot do anything, you know, if you cannot transact in something of value, right? And if you don't want to be, you know, somebody else's, you know, little, little donkey, which is the way I like to call it. Well, then you have to be, you know, the, uh, the master of your own domain. And the only way you're going to do this now is, you know, by holding your money, becoming, you know, the head of security, you're, you're, you're like the, the bank now and making sure that everybody that, that that's attached to you, whether your kid, your partner, whoever it is, they understand the significance of all of this and they, do the work as well so that they don't, you know, inadvertently blow everything up and lose it um, later on down the line. Because, you know, after we're gone on a Bitcoin standard, the world will truly flourish into a utopian work of art, in my opinion. Um, hopefully, you know, I can live long enough to see it at least, you know, start and uh, enjoy some of it. But, you know, in 100, 200 years from now, you know, Whoever will be born during that time will never know what we went through. In fact, if they ever read it in history, they will probably laugh at us as, you know, the, like the dumbest generation that ever lived <laughs> to actually think that, you know, worthless toilet paper controlled by someone else was a good idea. I, I truly think so too. Um, 
the endroutine, uh, as you know, it is uh, before like the, the previous guest is asking a question for the next guest without knowing who the next guest actually is. Um, and your question from the previous guest is, how can Bitcoin scale to 8 billion people using it as money? Uh, that's a million dollar question. Well, it certainly won't be on layer one. <laughs> so the Bitcoin, you know, that people are casually still buying today, that's not going to be how it scales. It'll likely scale, you know, on layer two, three, four solutions on top you know, of, of layer one. How exactly that happens, I don't know. But uh, I suspect, you know, I'm, I'm hoping, you know, that solutions are going to come about, you know, a lot quicker now, a lot faster now, now that it's being uh, legitimized more in, in the mainstream, you know, and, uh, you know, with politicians, you know, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of eyes and incentives on making this, you know, like the, the path forward. So how that, what that translates into, I don't know. There's a lot of projects being worked on right now. You know, all of them, you know, are still in development. So nothing is really concrete, but there's a lot of brilliant ideas. You know, they come out very regularly about this. And so we'll see which one sticks, but it's going to be easier to use Bitcoin. That's for sure. The, the complexities of, not that it's complex, but it'll become a lot simpler than it is already now you know, in, in, in the near future. And I'm not talking about 10, 20 years, I'd say maybe within less than five years, you know, the path to full self-custody will likely take lesser steps than it does now. Amazing. Uh, yeah. a, a lot, it, it's so fun to talk about that and, um, uh, and I asked so many different uh, people already on that. And it's, it's, it, it will be really fun. Like at one point I probably write an article, a short about like maybe like summarizing some of the opinions and giving him some, some direction. Um, perfect. And thank you, Tony, for, for being on, uh, for people that want to learn more about you or want to get in touch with you. Uh, how can they reach you? On social media, I'm very active on Twitter. It's uh, V4BTC. That's my handle. Otherwise, the BitcoinWay.com. You can find me there anytime. Um, reach out. We have a complimentary welcome call for anyone. You know, there's no commitment. It's a free 30 minute call. You call, we get to know you, ask anything you like, and uh, we take it from there. Thank you. Uh, perfect. And thank you for joining us today, Tony. Also, thank you for everyone watching and listening for joining us today. I'll be back as always tomorrow with another episode. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, Robin.